Good afternoon. My name is Tom Nastic, and I'm a public program producer here at the National Archives. Uh, today we welcome author Mark Harris to the William G. McGowan Theater to discuss his book, Five Came Back, a story of Hollywood and the Second World War. And a special welcome to those of you who are watching on our YouTube channel. It's most appropriate that the National Archives hosts this lecture, as the work and the careers of the five directors that you will soon hear more about, John Ford, Frank Capra, William Wyler, John Houston, and George Stevens, is well documented in the motion picture, textual, and photographic holdings of the National Archives. In fact, later today at 2 p.m., after the book signing up in the archive store, we will be screening John Houston's 1946 documentary produced for the Department of the Army, Let There Be Light. The version we will be showing uh, was recently digitally restored by the National Archives motion picture preservation staff. And for those of you watching online, you can also view the restored version on our YouTube channel, as well as other films by the five directors discussed today. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to tell you about a couple of upcoming programs that will take place here in the McGowan Theater. Tomorrow night, November 6th at 7 p.m., uh, a bipartisan group of former members of Congress will examine yesterday's election results in a panel discussion, Congressional Drama, Midterm Election Analysis. And next Wednesday night, November 12th at 7 p.m., we will welcome filmmaker Ivy Mirapol and her father, Michael Mirapol, who was the son of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, as we screen and discuss Ms. Mirapol's 2004 documentary, Heir to an Execution, A Granddaughter's Story. This program is presented in conjunction with our exhibit currently on display in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery, Making Their Mart Stories Through Signatures. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby along with a sign-up sheet so you can receive the calendar by regular mail and email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. Mark Harris is the author of Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies, and the Birth of the New Hollywood, which was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year and was named one of the 10 best nonfiction books of the decade by Salon a columnist for Entertainment Weekly and Grantland and a contributing editor at New York Magazine. He has written about pop culture and film history for many other publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Time, and GQ. Of Five Came Back, Paul Cantor of the Wall Street Journal wrote, Mr. Harris has a huge story to tell, and he does so brilliantly, maintaining suspense in a narrative whose basic outcome will be known ahead of time. Five Came Back is packed with true stories, that according to the proverb are stranger than fiction. Mr. Harris's story of five particular directors at one particular moment of history tells us much about the motion picture industry, about the nature of filmmaking, and more generally about the relation of art to the larger demands of society. Would you please welcome Mark Harris to the National Archives. Thank you very much for coming and giving me your lunch hour. Uh, I, um, I usually begin this uh, talk by telling people that we're going to go back to a very uh, different time in Hollywood and Washington, but actually the time we're going back to is a time when Republicans and Democrats were bitterly divided and Republicans in Congress accused the, accused the Democratic president of uh, creating an imperial presidency and uh, a great deal was at stake. So we're sort of going back to yesterday, but we're really going back about 75 years before that. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about why I wrote this book and then a lot more about what's in it, and then I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I, my father was a World War II veteran, uh, and when I was growing up uh, and very young, he would tell stories of the not particularly interesting part of World War II he served in, in Burma, and I would tune them out. I, I found it alienating and strange that someone would go off at 17 and leave home and, and uh, you know, live in the jungle uh, to defend democracy. And uh, uh, my father died when I was quite young, so I didn't get a chance, once I became more interested, to ask him about it. But I, I realized that my own aversion to this period uh, persisted as I became a film scholar. Uh, I noticed that the movies made from 1940 to 1945, both in Hollywood and for the government, were a period I had sort of avoided, uh, even though I liked all 
parts of movie history, I hadn't paid enough attention uh, to what Hollywood directors and what the government were doing in those years, uh, the, the sort of gap years between the very, very famous movies that many of them made both before and after the war. Uh, so I wanted in the book to investigate my own um, aversion to this subject a little bit, but I also uh, was very aware when I started working on the book that we were coming to uh, the close of, you know, well, when I started, uh, six or seven years uh, in two wars, and that the, uh, the output about those wars from Hollywood was almost non-existent. You could probably count on the fingers of uh, both your hands uh, the number of Hollywood movies of any note that have been made about uh, our experience in Iraq or Afghanistan, and you'd still have uh, some fingers left over. Uh, I was fascinated by the fact that during World War II, an average of three to four movies a week with some content about World War II were released by the Hollywood studios, 150 to 200 movies a year in 1942 and 1943. Um, movies were the fabric of people's consciousness back then. Uh, 80 million Americans a week went to the movies. And while we often say that uh, that was a time of escape where you could go to a movie theater and forget your troubles, it was also a time of engagement because movie theaters were really one of only three places where you could get the news. You could read the newspaper or magazines, you could listen to the radio, or you could go to the theater and see newsreels and nonfiction shorts, which changed every week. Um, so it's interesting to me that because those shorts preceded the main features, uh, going to a movie theater was both escape and engagement. Uh, you 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 went there to learn about the world and then maybe to forget your troubles or perhaps to see movies that engaged with the world. Because films were produced so much more quickly uh, in the early 1940s and late 1930s than they are now, uh, movies could have a certain kind of immediacy. Right now, usually, when you see a Hollywood movie, even if everything has gone according to plan, at minimum, it's about two years from the time that movie is conceived and really aggressively put into motion to the time you see it. Uh, back in World War II, six months was a lot more common. And not just six months, but movies uh, could change and in fact were changed to reflect war headlines sometimes as little as uh, five or six weeks before they reached theaters. Um, you know, whether it was a new ending or an overdubbed line or, or uh, a new title even to reflect what was going on in the world. Um, movies had a kind of immediacy uh, that made them, in a way, news. Now, the subject I was writing about uh, was five directors, uh, five of the most prominent directors in Hollywood at the time of Pearl Harbor, which is when, within weeks or months, they all left those Hollywood careers behind to go uh, accept officers' commissions uh, and serve uh, in the war as propagandists and as documentarians for the next three or four years. Uh, those directors were Frank Capra, who uh, at the time of Pearl Harbor was the most famous and the richest director in America. He had been on the cover of Time magazine uh, as the millionaire director. Uh, they called him Columbia's gem because he almost single-handedly kept Columbia Studios afloat. Uh, by that point, he had made uh, three movies that won him Oscars. Uh, you Can't Take It With You. It Happened One Night, Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and followed those three with... Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, a movie that um, had delighted audiences and uh, alienated much of Congress and the Senate, which thought it was an outrageous insult um, and were shocked that they would be depicted as succumbing to infighting and cronyism. Um, uh, 
William Wyler uh, was known as the consummate craftsman in Hollywood, particularly for the movies he had made before the war with Betty Davis, Jezebel, The Letter, and The Little Foxes. Uh, his nickname was 40 Take Wyler or 50 Take Wyler, depending on who was doing the complaining. Uh, he, he made people do it over and over and over again uh, until they got it right. He was also uh, a Jewish immigrant from uh, a region of Alsace that when he was a teenager had been variously controlled by the French or the Germans. Um, and privately, although he, he did not really, he was not an outspoken uh, person before the war, either as a Jew or as a leftist, privately he was working terribly hard to sponsor as many as 25 friends and relatives who were desperate to get out of Europe. Um, and uh, his conscience was increasingly uh, pricking at him. He really wanted to do something um, to help the war effort very, very badly. Uh, one of his best friends in Hollywood, my third director, was John Huston, who was the youngest and the least experienced of the five directors I write about. He had been a successful screenwriter uh, for the last several years in Hollywood, including working for Weiler. But at the time of Pearl Harbor, he had just gotten uh, his first break directing a movie. Uh, and his very first movie was The Maltese Falcon, which um, had just become a huge hit and was opening up huge possibilities for him as a director, all of which he was going to have to immediately shut down to go serve in the war. He did make... Uh, one and two thirds more movies before uh, leaving um, uh, for service. The the two thirds was a movie called Across the Pacific, which reunited his uh, Maltese Falcon stars uh, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Sidney Greenstreet. And uh, he had to um, uh, hand it over to another director with uh, several days to go because he had forgotten what day he was supposed to go serve. Um, Houston, uh, in those years before the war, was known as a little bit of a, a flake and a rake, and forgetting something like that would not have been atypical for him. John Ford, my fourth director, and the only one of the directors I write about who joined the Navy rather than the Army, was, if Capra was known as the most successful director, Ford, at the time of Pearl Harbor, was probably known as America's best director. Uh, he had had an extraordinary run between 1939 and 1941. He directed seven pictures, including Stagecoach, Drums Along the Mohawk, Young Mr. Lincoln, The Grapes of Wrath, The Long Voyage Home, Tobacco Road, and How Green Was My Valley. Um, I, I, I would say that for three years, that output is still uh, probably unmatched by any director. Um, and uh, although... If, if you've read Ford biographies, you know that after the war uh, and straight into his declining years and the Nixon years, he, he leaned very, very strongly to the right. Um, uh, Ford considered himself a left Democrat when he went into the war um, uh, and uh, was absolutely uh, outspoken about it at times. Um, my fifth director, George Stevens, started... Uh, with Laurel and Hardy shorts, and in the 1930s graduated to become one of the most skilled directors of Hollywood escapism. Movies like Vivacious Lady with Ginger Rogers, Swing Time, which teamed Rogers and Astaire, Gunga Din, um, Woman of the Year, uh, the first time that Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy teamed up. Uh, Stevens was uh, a native Californian. Like Houston, he had grown up in a showbiz family. Uh, he also wanted to do more, wanted to make socially relevant movies, and was uh, frustrated first by RKO and then uh, by Columbia. Uh, so many of these directors were looking for adventure, were tired of being pigeonholed, and uh, wanted to serve. Um, what serving meant turned out to be a lot more complicated than any of them anticipated. Uh, you know, they were very, very bent on doing their patriotic duty, but the whole premise of my book and the whole premise of bringing them into the War Department and the Army and the Navy proceeds in a way from a counterintuitive idea, which is the fact that uh, George Marshall and the Roosevelt administration uh, 
very, very intelligently and I think presciently realized that World War II would need to be documented visually in order to be sold to the American people and that it would have to be sold even after Pearl Harbor all the way through the war. Um, that was, I think, extraordinarily forward thinking if you consider the fact that sound movies were only 12 years old at the time um, this, this uh, war started. It would be as if now, uh, or, well, no, really, it, it would be as if 10 years ago uh, the government had realized that the internet was the best way to reach people. Um, so... When I think I think one has to give uh, the Roosevelt administration credit for being very forward-thinking about that. The counterintuitive part was that they decided to turn to f men who were best known for creating fiction in order to have fact documented successfully. And they did have other options. There were five or six major newsreel companies. They could have turned to Pathé. They could have turned to Hearst, The March of Time. Um, they didn't think that the newsreel style of filmmaking was the way to go. They thought that uh, Hollywood filmmakers who could succeed in rousing the passion and the emotion of the American public would be better equipped to explain and to sell the war to them than, uh, than journalists and then and the newsreel men were. Um, this led to a, a, a sort of conflict of, not so much a conflict of interest as a conflict of three different interests in the guys that I wrote about. Uh, obviously, one, as artists and as craftsmen, they were interested in making the best, most gripping, most effective, most powerful movies with the best stories. That was just what was second nature to them. They were storytellers. Uh, second, as patriots... Um, they wanted to serve their country. That was absolutely their motive for going. They wanted to help the cause. Uh, and third, as newly minted documentarians and as, as men, they were interested in telling the truth. Uh, that was very, very important to them. So to make great movies, to serve their country, and to tell the truth collided with each other in really problematic ways almost from the beginning of their service. Um, almost always one of those goals was compromised. Often two of those goals were compromised. Sometimes all three of those goals were compromised. Uh, and I'm going to give you a few examples of that. Um, I will say that when I was working on this book, uh, I did about four years of research on it, both from the Hollywood side of things, because all of the... Um, Directors I wrote about had their papers, their diaries, their war journals, their logs, their production sheets carefully archived. And on the government side, uh, thanks, and this gives me a, a public opportunity to thank not only the National Archives and, and the Library of Congress, without which really writing this book uh, would have been impossible. And I know I'm not the first or the hundredth writer to say that, but it really is true. We depend on these facilities so much. Um, I tried to remember while I was writing this book that every word that I used had a different meaning in the early 1940s than it does now. Propaganda was not necessarily a dirty word. Documentary did not necessarily mean true. Reenactments were used incredibly frequently uh, in documentaries and and both the documentarians and the critics were rather matter-of-fact about it. Uh, it. It was just felt that it was an acceptable film technique in many cases and that if you weren't overtly misleading about it, um, it, it was a tool of the filmmaker's trade and shouldn't be shunned. Um, so I, try, I tried not to write the book with a sort of smug hindsight of uh, bewilderment that these filmmakers didn't have the cultural information that we have 75 years later. But I also tried not to fall prey to the reverse, which was writing everything off by saying, uh, well, the times were different then. Because the truth is that even though the times were different then, there was bitter dispute about some of these issues. And there were people who I think proved that they were very much on the right side of things and people who didn't. Um, however, uh, 
in writing about the filmmaking that I chose to write about in the book, um, it didn't divide neatly into this film is honest and therefore good, this film is dishonest and therefore bad. It turned out to be um, a really interesting spectrum, uh, a, a large, large gray area, um, which is interesting because, of course, in many ways we think of World War II as one of the most black and white of of all conflicts, and I don't think that we're wrong about that. But in filmmaking, uh, it was gray. Um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about a movie that was probably the single worst violation of anything we associate with filmmaking ethics uh, and and even with wartime ethics uh, that the Americans had their name on. And that was a movie called Tunisian Victory. Um, one thing about these directors is that they didn't lose their competitive edge when they left Hollywood and came here to Washington. In fact, uh, it was heightened. And one of the early ways that manifested itself was with it was in intense competition with the British. Um, the English, uh, the British Army Film Unit had started its work, uh, for obvious reasons, two years before uh, the Americans did. They were in the war for two years longer, and so their uh, propaganda effort was two years better and stronger and, and quicker off the mark. Um, and those movies, many of them, were shown in the United States, not in art houses, but in mainstream theaters. A lot of people saw them either as features or as shorts before any number of Hollywood entertainment films. One movie in particular called Desert Victory had really excited the attention of a great number of uh, audience members, certainly of critics, and of uh, openly envious Hollywood filmmakers. Desert Victory was a documentary about uh, the... Uh, the Allied victory in North Africa, which was after uh, many, many rough months of war in the Pacific, one of the first things that home front audiences could turn to here as the sign that maybe things were going the right way for the Allies. Um, Desert Victory was about the push into, you know, North Africa, and... Uh, it was made entirely by the English and strongly suggested that whatever role the Americans played in it was either peripheral or non-existent. Um, this, you know, Frank Capra felt and, and uh, many people in the War Department felt was no way for an ally to treat an ally, but the Brits had a kind of ironclad response to it, which was, you didn't have any good footage. You weren't there. You didn't shoot anything. Uh, the reason they didn't have good footage uh, is a sort of catastrophic long story about the, the moral of which is don't put all your eggs in one basket, especially if your eggs are film and the basket is a boat that's going to get sunk. But be that as it may... Uh, the, the the Brits were right. The the Americans didn't have uh, great footage, and Frank Capra, who of the five directors was really the one who was in charge of everything. He wasn't in charge of John Ford, who was in the Navy, but Capra was stationed in Washington. He was he he made his big task to make the seven Why We Fight films, which were films basically detailing the history of. Uh, Axis aggression over the previous 10 years, and they were shown to every uh, incoming GI. Um, Capper was in charge of coordinating the overall filmmaking effort, and uh, the idea was that the Americans would make their own response to Desert Victory called Tunisian Victory, uh, which would show that the Americans did actually have a great part in uh, the victory in North Africa. Um, since there was no footage, Capra enlisted two of his um, his colleagues in a deception. George Stevens, who was the last uh, of the five directors to go in and actually was the last to come out of the war, had arrived in Algiers 
two days after uh, everyone had left and victory had been declared. He, he got there incredibly excited to film the war, only to discover that there was nothing to film. So Capra told him to film it, to just restage what had happened. And with the full cooperation of the army, Stevens was given soldiers and tanks and pointed toward villages and filmed them being re-liberated. Um, so the, these, these uh, villagers who had been recently sort of traumatized by tanks rolling through their towns got to see them again, rolling through their towns, shooting, um, rolling over stuff for no particular reason but so that it could be captured by cameras. Um, that didn't really sit well with Stevens, but orders were orders, and he was still new to the war, and he sent his footage back to uh, Capra. Capra then turned to John Houston uh, for an even more remarkable thing, which was to document the Tunisian air war over the Mojave Desert and Orlando, Florida. Um, Houston flew to... Uh, uh, Orlando, to, uh, or first to the Mojave Desert, uh, to a training facility uh, that was being used, in fact, by the Army to simulate desert conditions for uh, draftees who were about to be uh, posted over to North Africa. Uh, the Army obligingly built uh, enemy tanks out of tank shells covered with canvas. They looked convincing enough if you filmed them from a long distance, and then sent uh, planes up in the air to bomb them. Uh, so that Houston uh, could film them. And then uh, he moved on to Orlando for the aerial combat sequences, uh, which was, you know, painted planes and uh, had a camera crew uh, that he was directing in the air that was so unsuited to World War II footage that when, at one point, he... he he yelled to them, enemy coming in at 2 o'clock. His pilot looked at his watch. Um, <laughs> that footage, which was pretty terrible um, and uh, would not fool any of you for a second and actually did not fool many people back then for a second, uh, was then compiled into something, and, and this is where it really got ugly, Capra and Houston were told to go to London where the English were preparing uh, a sequel to uh, Desert Victory and convinced them to scrap that film and make this an Anglo-American joint venture in which the very good footage of uh, the English filmmaking crews and the very bad footage of the American filmmaking crews would be combined. Um, and... Capra, who was really remarkable at convincing himself of the patriotism and validity of anything, um, did this and actually talked himself into believing that it was a test of British commitment to the war. That, in other words, if, if the Brits were really uh, anti-Nazi and ready to be allies, they would accept this deal without even demanding to see what the American footage looked like. And after weeks of jousting about this, um, that is what they did. Uh, the English swallowed hard and made this movie. Now, the ironic thing is here, it turned out later that um, the British had also been faking tons of footage. They just did it way better than the Americans did. They had studios where, you know, the right amount of sweat was put onto uh, officers staring into the blazing sun. They, they, they were just sharper about this. Uh, but, you know, the, the resulting movie, um, Tunisian Victory, uh, was, uh, you know, released widely in the United States and was really quite terrible um, and was passed off as, as absolute truth. The interesting thing is that uh, despite that big deception, uh, that was the only stretch of the war uh, where for any real length of time Capra left the country um, to, uh, to go to Europe. And his experience of seeing uh, London bombed and of uh, 
waking up in the middle of the night, you know, uh, because of air raids and, and seeing old women and children uh, huddling in their robes in the street profoundly moved him and really gave him a, a, a deeper conception of what the war was about and what its cost was than he had had before. And it probably turned him into a better propagandist and a better wartime documentarian when he got back to Washington, where he was for most of the rest of the war. Um, that I, I've given you a really terrible example. Um, but in a way, what's more telling is the, the stories of filmmakers during the war who struggled with compromises but found ways to build integrity into their movies uh, despite the necessary compromises. I'll tell you a little bit about two movies, one directed by John Ford, The Battle of Midway, and one called Memphis Bell, uh, the first great documentary of the air war, which was made in England by William Wyler. Um, one thing about all of these movies that we're talking about is that if any kind of combat or outdoor footage or, or non-staged footage was involved, there was almost no possibility of a live soundtrack. It was absolutely an accepted convention uh, of the time that the soundtrack for all of these movies, including the ambient soundtrack, not just the music and the narration, would be created later. So for the Battle of Midway, uh, which was really the first time Americans saw American soldiers in an engagement during the war. Uh, Ford was taken to Midway Island by the Navy without knowing that there was that the Navy knew that there was about to be a major Japanese attack on the island and that the Navy would be ready to uh, respond to it. He was uh, stationed on the roof of a power station uh, with a perfect vantage point of uh, zeros incoming and flying overhead, uh, basically overhead to the battle behind him. He and two cameramen filmed as much as they could. Uh, you can see, uh, if you see the movie, which is about 18 minutes long, uh, extraordinary color footage, which is another innovation of the... Um, uh, of, of the time, since all newsreels were in black and white, and, and color at that time oddly was considered a sort of trapping of escapist movies. It was it was jolting to see explosions uh, of of yellow and orange against a blue sky with plumes of black smoke coming up from them. That that was a, a version of war that that no one in America had ever seen, and and the Battle of Midway um, was. Uh, shown by the end of its run in three quarters of all American movie theaters. So one thing you have to remember about these movies is that people didn't just see them once, especially if they were short, uh, because they played before features. Uh, every week you'd see The Battle of Midway before a different movie for as long as it played. Um, so this this became the, the text, the visual text of what World War II was to people. Um, but what to do about the soundtrack? You could see the explosions, but you couldn't hear the explosions. How to how to create a real sense of uh, veracity? Ford used, I think, a really interesting technique, which is that his soundtrack for the first third of the movie, which is the pre-battle setup, is filled with what we think of as Hollywood elements: uh, orchestral music, songs. And not one, but four narrators. Uh, he, he used two sort of conventional voiceover narrators, but he also used Jane Darwell and Henry Fonda, who had just been seen and were familiar to tens of millions of Americans as the mother and son in The Grapes of Wrath. They narrate as if they are two members of the audience watching the movie. Um, so you hear... Uh, Jane Darwell, as a young man, passes across the screen, says something like, why, that's Junior Kinney. He's from my hometown. And then you hear Henry Fonda say, uh, yes, well, he's a, an a, a army sergeant now. Um, so when the audience is comforted by this kind of 
general ambience that they're in a movie and they're listening to people talk about a movie, the battle begins, and at that point, every sound drops out. Narration, voiceover, music, songs, the only thing that you hear for probably five or six minutes is explosions. Um, now, those explosions were dubbed in later, but the sudden switch from a very familiar kind of sound to a very unfamiliar kind of sound did a great deal uh, to convey the reality of air battle and, and sea battle to people that, um, that I don't think necessarily violated any precept of honesty at the time. Now, you turn to Memphis Bell, uh, William Wyler had uh, gone to London and, and conceived the idea of flying uh, several missions with a bombing crew. He had two ideas. One was to do a sort of 10-man portrait of the crew of a bomber, and the other was to do a sort of portrait of a bomber itself. The, the rule at the time was that if a bomber went on 25 successful missions, um, it's crew would get a nice long furlough back in the United States. And he thought it would be great to follow a bomber on its 25th mission. He merged those two ideas into one documentary called Memphis Bell, which is a, a truly great documentary. You can see it on uh, YouTube, um, and I, I really do recommend it, as, as I do the Battle of Midway. Um, but again, the soundtrack issue, especially difficult because he was flying, and, and Weiler himself... Uh, flew in the planes and, and uh, was one of the men operating the cameras. He was the 11th man on the mission. Uh, these, these bombers were unpressurized. Uh, the temperatures were extraordinarily low. You had to wear oxygen masks and heavy gloves. If you took them off for more than a minute, uh, you'd faint and your hands would freeze. Frostbite was actually the thing that grounded more pilots in England uh, than any other problem. Um, so Sound equipment simply would not work up there. It was out of the question. Uh, what to do about the soundtrack? Weiler, who was a stickler for accuracy, um, decided that after the 25th mission, when uh, he, when the crew got to go on a victory tour in the United States and he himself was sent back to Los Angeles to prepare the movie, he would have the crew itself record the lines that he had written down when he heard them use them in the plane. So at the end of their victory tour, he threw a big Hollywood party for them. He asked each one, which Hollywood star do you most want to meet? He invited them all. They all came. Uh, and then he brought them into the studio uh, to just, in a non-actorish way, dub their lines over the sound of motors and rotors and airplanes and and explosions and bombs dropping that he had post-dubbed in. Um, this actually occasioned a censorship fight because uh, they had cursed, and Weiler wanted that in the movie. Mild things, you know, watch out, you son of a bitch, things like that, um, or hell, or damn. Uh, this inflamed uh, the guardians of the production code and the Catholic Church uh, and became such a nasty uh, publicity uh, issue that eventually they carved out a sort of special one-time only exception about language used under duress in times of war by men in pressured circumstances for this movie only. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm touched by the fact that Weiler worked so hard to... Uh, um, make his movie as real as possible within the constraints that it couldn't be real. The book is filled with um, complex issues like this. John Huston made a film called The Battle of San Pietro uh, about the liberation of a small ancient village in Italy um, that was uh, passed off by the army preposterously as true. Um, it was entirely restaged. Uh, the army not only passed it off as true, but um, uh, issued press releases uh, to journalists saying that Houston and his crew were so brave that they actually 
went into the village ahead of the American soldiers so that they could then turn their cameras around and show the American soldiers advancing into the village. Whenever you see that in a World War II documentary, you know that you're looking at something staged. In fact, the village had already been taken um, by the time Houston got there. And uh, at Capper's instruction and with the full cooperation of the army, he spent six weeks uh, using soldiers to restage it. You know, this seems like a massive act of falsification, and it is. I mean, the, the, the army lied about it and, and fooled almost everyone. In Houston's heart, he was not trying to put anything over on anyone. He had seen battle. He had seen what it looked like. He wanted to create a film that for the first time would show American audiences what a ground battle really looked like. And so when you see San Pietro, you are seeing something that's not true, and yet you are also seeing a great director create a vocabulary of visual realism that is still in use today. Houston made sure that when an explosion happened, the camera shook because, of course, the cameraman would be startled. That was something that uh, people hadn't seen before, really, a kind of dirty realism that, that was used, not... not uh, intentionally used, but but it showed up in the Battle of Midway, but but Houston created uh, a look for what uh, combat really looked like, and he created that look by taking everything smooth about movies and throwing it out. He, he And one of the great discoveries uh, I had in the National Archives was uh, looking at the footage that uh, was in College Park, Maryland, and seeing the outtakes from San Pietro. And, and you can see that Houston, I mean, there are some comical outtakes where, you know, the soldiers start laughing, and that's obviously not really usable. But you can also see that he, he seems to have thrown out anything that looked too smooth, too Hollywood, too natural. Um, was his goal to deceive, or was his goal to create something that he felt was real and show it to the American people. It's complicated, and it's still being fought out. And I think that the degree to which it's a loaded topic, um, I, I can tell you that I got some reviews for this book that said, you know, oh, the, Houston turns out to have been a total fraud, and other reviews who said, no, he's much, much too hard on San Pietro. It's an important movie. It doesn't matter whether it was restaged or not. So, so these issues still are in play. Um, I do want to say that one of the things that most moved me about uh, writing this book was the story of George Stevens, who goes from, uh, as I said, participating in this charade by restaging uh, the Battle of... Uh, the liberation of North Africa, to uh, joining the Paris, uh, uh, joining the French army and marching into uh, Paris for the liberation, um, where he uh, he actually restaged one of the most famous and widely seen uh, uh, pieces of footage of the war, which was the surrender of the. A Vichy general. Um, he shot it as it happened inside a train station um, and then uh, said to uh, the general, I'm sorry, we're going to have to do this out in the courtyard. The light wasn't good enough. And, and both the, you know, the victorious general and the surrendering general uh, sort of said, you want us to do it again? And uh, Stephen said, c'est la guerre, général, c'est la guerre. Um, and actually took them both into the courtyard. They, he resurrendered, and that was the footage that was widely seen. Um, but the journey of Stevens is such that uh, one of the things that ends the book is the fact that he was, uh, he and his filmmaking team were the first major American filmmakers into the camps. Um, and the, the footage that Stevens shot at Dachau none of which is staged, none of which is manipulated, um, is, to me, so moving in part because it is the journey of uh, 
a director from creator of footage to restager of footage to pure witness to compiler of evidence. Um, the, the footage that Stevens and his men shot at Dachau gave us our first real understanding of the atrocities of the death camps and what they looked like. And in fact, Stevens stayed on in Europe long after the war was over uh, to turn the film he shot into two hour-long evidentiary movies that were used in a very, very important way um, at the Nuremberg trials and, and were seen by many people as having changed the mood of that courtroom and, and, and sealed the fate of many of the Nuremberg defendants. Um, there is a lot more in the book that I'm not going to tell you because I'm still hoping that some of you will buy it. Um, <laughs> But um, I, I hope I've given you a taste of some of the issues I raise in it, and I'm happy to take questions. I think there are microphones on either side, and uh, if you could use them, I'd be grateful. And thank you. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, thank you for your program. Um, were African Americans able to... Um, to assist uh, any of the five directors? Did they get any technical help from some of the brilliant uh, African Americans? Uh, did everyone hear that question? Good. Um, you know, the, the story of African Americans in the war is fascinating. Weiler's crew, Weiler's immediate crew was white, so was uh, Ford's, but um, they're Weiler at different times and Capra were both involved uh, in the creation of a documentary called The Negro Soldier, um, which was uh, intended uh, as propaganda to uh, convince uh, African Americans that it was their patriotic duty to join up because uh, there was a remarkable survey that showed that almost half of all men in Harlem at one point uh, during the war thought that they would be no worse off under Japanese occupation um, than they were under the sort of segregationist policies of, of the U.S. government. Um, that led to great fears in the South of what they called a Negro-Japanese alliance, you know, uh, and, and actually led to some Japanese propaganda aimed at black Americans who were disenchanted with the U.S. government. Um, Weiler started off uh, intending to make that movie and became so disgusted by the racism uh, aimed at uh, African Americans by the white military that he refused to make it. Um, Capra eventually... Uh, turned the making of the movie over to a black screenwriter named Carlton Moss, and, and the resulting movie is considered um, a real step forward and actually was one of the few uh, documentaries uh, about the war that became a breakout hit among mass audiences. Um, that story is in the book. Also, there, there's a story about... Uh, you see that John Ford frequently inserted footage of um, black sailors. Uh, you know, it was really important to him to convey the idea that um, African Americans were an essential part of the fighting force. So, so yeah, that is part of the story. Thank you. Yes. Yes, uh, Dr. Harris, thank you. Very fine presentation. Serious, entertaining, certainly illuminating. Illuminating. Uh, you answered a question on the Holocaust that I had. How long did it take to make these documentaries, films in general, on the average? Uh, many of them were done very, very quickly. Uh, the uh, Capra was ready. The Why We Fight films, which I mentioned, which were seven hour long movies, uh, Capra had seven screenwriters, including the guys who wrote Casablanca, fly uh, from Hollywood to Washington within two or three weeks after he got there. Two weeks later, they had scripts ready. Um, one reason these movies went quickly is that there was very little money for them. The government had uh, 
an ambitious idea that Americans should make these movies, but they weren't about to spend money on them. And, and uh, Republicans in Congress in particular, Republicans and also Democratic isolationists, thought it was disgusting that any money would be spent on movie making uh, as opposed to you know, material or men. So uh, they had to use a lot of existing footage, um, enemy propaganda that the Treasury Department had seized, or American propaganda footage, stock footage that had been used. So sometimes they were assembled within a matter of uh, two weeks. Other times, it took a lot longer. Uh, John Huston spent four months in the Aleutians uh, filming his first major war documentary, which was called Report from the Aleutians. Yeah, thank you. And second, uh, are these stored here at the archives or elsewhere? And... Uh, uh, did they really engender patriotism and or energy for support to a very large degree? Um, I think most of them are stored at the archives. Uh, many of them are available as um, uh, DVD-Rs, you know, burned DVDs that you can get online. Some of them are on YouTube. Um, you, you know, you, you can, they're mostly public domain, so you can find a surprising number of them here. And, and the answer to the last part of your question is, yeah, they, they absolutely did stir um, uh, patriotism. The Why We Fight films in particular, uh, Weiler, who had nothing to do with them, said right after the war was over that he thought that they would be Capra's most enduring legacy, which is a remarkable thing to say about a director who had already won three Academy Awards. Uh, yes? Did the directors you wrote about uh, have any involvement in any of the movies about Pearl Harbor, and how was the original footage from Pearl Harbor incorporated into later movies about Pearl Harbor? Um, shortly after Pearl Harbor, uh, Greg Toland, who had been a really important cinematographer, not a director, but he shot Citizen Kane and was considered one of the great Hollywood uh, photographers, was sent to... Um, was sent to Hawaii to make a documentary called December 7th, which was supposed to be about what happened at Pearl Harbor, but with the propagandistic purpose of showing how quickly and effectively uh, the Navy was going to rebuild. Um, there, there wasn't a great deal of footage shot of the actual Pearl Harbor attack. There were a couple of usable minutes because it was a surprise. Um, Toland who had always wanted to direct, kind of went off in a mad direction of his own and ended up conceiving the idea for an entire feature film with actors, with uh, restaging. The movie he made, which was about 80 minutes long, was uh, and which did use some of that Pearl Harbor footage, but also used an actor playing Uncle Sam, an actor playing the American conscience, actors playing soldiers in heaven, um, the movie was so virulently anti-Japanese that even for the time, the government refused to release it. it. It basically suggested that every Asian person living in Hawaii was a sleeper agent um, and that they couldn't be trusted. And, uh, I mean, this is sort of for the worst of reasons, but the reason uh, the, the film was censored by the government was that at the time... Uh, the, they, there were all these Japanese Americans in uh, American internment camps, and the plan was to redistribute them to towns in the south and southwest and midwest, just a few in each town, so that they could never get together and you know have a cabal or something. And it was felt that this movie would frighten those towns into refusing to accept. Japanese Americans as residents. So the movie was censored. Um, John Ford took it over, cut out almost all of the uh, problematic material, uh, reduced the movie, I think, from 83 to 38 minutes. Um, and uh, it's, it's an instructive difference in approaches to propaganda. And again, both of those, both of those versions um, are available to see if anyone is curious about them. Thank you.
It's, it's often said that Vietnam was the first uh, war that came into people's living rooms, but with everyone going to the movies and seeing these uh, scenes of war, either real or restaged, it would seem that the, there's a, a consciousness of, of what war is. But were the films shot, just as you've been mentioning, uh, with such a patriotic uh, theme behind them that there was no negative reaction uh, to the war after seeing these films? No, there was definitely negative reaction. I mean, in, in fact, uh, the movie that's going to be shown this afternoon, Let There Be Light, um, was intended as propaganda, um, uh, but, but uh, there was such reaction to the honesty with which the psychological scarring of veterans was shown that it was really problematic. Houston, in particular, always ran into trouble with his documentaries uh, in that they were um, too real. Some people thought the Battle of San Pietro uh, was was um, much too blunt about the cost of war to American lives. In fact, there, there are scenes in San Pietro of American bodies um, being uh, taken away for burial. Uh, the War Department flatly refused to approve those, so Houston just said to them, oh, well, those bodies aren't American, they're Italian. And the War Department said it was okay. Also, his first movie, Report from the Aleutians, um, suggested something that no uh, wartime documentary had suggested, was, which was that war was really boring, that there were weeks and weeks and weeks of waiting for something to happen and sitting around and doing nothing. Um, that was considered a really problematic message to send and, and uh, was one of the things that resulted in the movie's release being delayed for months after it was complete. So um, all five of the directors at one time or another were, were pushing against a system that did not want their movies to be as realistic or as blunt as they even were. Um, I have uh, two questions. Um, the first question, I mean, you, you kind of um, intimate that there might be something in that direction. The first question is, did any of these guys, um, I'm talking to directors, come back from World War II and the experiences in it, whatever experiences they had, highly critical of war, and what effects potential uh, did this have on the rest of their work? Um, you know, did they come back more cynical about war? Did they come back anti-war? That's the first question. The second question is a much more problematical question. Um, the notion of Hollywood role in um, undergirding, in essence, the military-industrial complex. This, this came later, right? Uh, I mean, if you want to make a war film and stuff like that, you know, you need to go to the War Department. You need to show them uh, stuff and th your, your screenplay, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, you, do, you don't even talk about, uh, you know, World War One had some war movies come out of it, right. but also the very critical one about, you know, about anti-war movie. Yes. Um, so um, how do you see that? Do you see uh, at this point in time a kind of coming together of Hollywood with uh, the filmmaking community and how this problematical and complex uh, interaction uh, takes place? And do you feel that maybe the War Department, Pentagon, etc., the military industrial complex have at this point in time, too much influence on, on, on war making? Uh, do you see it as something that is, you know, if a filmmaker wants to make some type of film, he has to have some material, and he's, uh, he's you know, he has much, not, are you, not are many you options. Are you asking about this point in time now? Right, this point okay. in time. Now, uh, the development towers this point in time. Now, if you can give an oversight of sure. it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. um, well, let me answer your first question first. Um, the, the directors were tremendously influenced uh, by their experiences in the war. Uh, in different ways, they resonated uh, for the rest of their careers. Um, you know, John Huston during the war was accused at one point by the, the War Department after he made San Pietro of making an anti-war movie. And his response was, well, if I ever make a pro-war movie, I hope someone takes me out and shoots me dead. Um, uh, Stevens was so profoundly shattered by what he saw at um, Dachau that uh, he never made another comedy um, and said he could not make another comedy. Uh, to the part of your first question that uh, addressed whether that had any influence on the war itself and the way the war was depicted, no, because the war was over 
by the time four of these five directors came back and almost over by the time Ford came back. Um, so there was, no, there was no change in heart about what, more, what war meant among these five directors that happened early enough so that it manifested itself in movies that made it to the screen while the war was on. Although you can certainly see if you look at the Hollywood movies about war from 1941 through 1946, you can see a, a gradual uh, change in what attitude those movies take toward war and its costs. And, and you know, in the first really great movie about the post-war experience, which is William Wyler's The Best Years of Our Lives, um, you see in that film some real honesty about the the trauma and the cost of war to these men. Uh, I, I, I don't want to give a, a glib answer to your second question about the, the military-industrial complex um, because, you know, it... it it deserves an answer that that is the length of another book, I think, frankly. But um, you know, I do think that we've we've the, these. I don't use this word in the book, but these guys, these directors, were essentially the early equivalent of what we now call embeds. Uh, you know, they were they were quasi journalists uh, given access uh, in exchange for delivering information about the war to civilians that the military wanted delivered. Um, I think the great thing about them as filmmakers um, is that that proved to be a lot more complicated uh, than the War Department ever anticipated it would be. And as much as the War Department resisted what they did, um, it's, it's probably to the War Department's credit that with one exception, all of the movies that these directors made that the War Department resisted got shown to Americans during the war. Not, sometimes not as quickly as they should have been, um, but, uh, and sometimes somewhat tampered with, but, but a lot of what these directors wanted to do, um, came through. The whole question about, the, the question about whether American filmmakers should put themselves in the service of a war I don't think I can answer here because the problem is it's, it's not a question to be answered about a war or a filmmaker. Uh, in, in the case of these filmmakers and this war, I think that, the, that what they delivered and what they showed uh, the American public um, was on balance worth it and helpful, and I don't mean helpful simply in selling the war, I mean helpful in terms of making people understand some truths about the war that they might not have otherwise. So I, 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 I'm very inclined to defend these particular filmmakers and what they did. I wouldn't want to apply that defense to a different set of filmmakers and a different war and a different media environment, and a, a different, you know, uh, frankly, a different military-industrial complex. I hope that answers part of your question. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.